You are listening to the Foreign Policy Focus Podcast. We cannot wait for the final proof. The smoking gun could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Haven't you driven enough people from their homes already? Bulldoze their villages, seize their property under the laws they had no part in making. Now working in Libya with friends and allies, we've demonstrated what collective action can achieve in the 21st century. Now the host of the show, Kyle Inslee. This is episode 449 of the Foreign Policy Focus podcast. On today's show, I'm talking about Trump's deal of the century, looking at some of the details of Trump's proposal, why it was fail, and that the purpose of this was to fail. I'm looking back at 2019 and two records being sent, one for Lockheed Martin in sales and the other Afghanistan for being on the receiving end of U.S. airstrike. All right, everybody, I need you to share the show. You find it online at the Libertarian Institute. I write the news roundup at the Institute in both the show and the news roundup are on the homepage, libertarianinstitute.org. You can help the show out by subscribing to it, giving it a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. That also makes sure you don't miss an episode of the show. I do three a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And last, donate to the show at patreon.com slash foreign policy focus. First up on today's show is Lockheed Martin's record sales nearly $60 billion in 2019. I have this article here from Defense One. I'll have it linked in the show notes page. Honestly, it reads a little bit more like a celebratory press release, but nonetheless, it has some pretty good information on here on what um, Lockheed Martin was selling in 2019 and where they're making all their money from. One of the amazing things is while this $60 billion in 2019 is a record, they're projected to make even more in 2020 uh 62 billion to 65 billion so quite quite crazy how much uh the executives at Lockheed Martin and their shareholders are going to be raking in the 60 billion dollars in sales resulted in 11 percent growth again that's you know where you're looking at the uh shareholders they say 20 percent of the growth comes from sales of tactical weapons uh patriot missile interceptors and work on hypersonic missiles So looking at some of these products, uh, like the Patriot Interceptors, they haven't really proven to be effective where they needed them. Saudi Arabia had several of these systems deployed, and a key oil facility was damaged by several missiles launched, at at least claimed by the Houthi. I mean, there's people who dispute that, but and and where maybe the technology came from, but uh, drones and cruise missiles are able to penetrate that system. So while Americans spend a lot of money on it, is shown that, you know, countries with, you know, military budgets, tiny, tiny fractions out of America, like Iran, and groups like the Houthi with, you know, no military budget, and, you know, they're more almost of an insurgency than a government, seeing they have pretty much no international recognition and are blockaded off from the world. I mean, they do hold a capital city, and they've ruled it for five years, so you have to say they're somewhat of a government, but... Uh, you know, they're able to successfully use missiles to hit Saudi uh, targets from time to time as well. The hypersonic missiles are something that it's just so dangerous. You know, they're going to put nuclear warheads on these things to combat Russia, who did this, who, you know, built these in response to the U.S. building the missile interceptors. And this is just going to keep going on and on. And it's going to cost an awful lot of money. And these are all just doomsday weapons. They don't actually do anything to improve any of our lives. This article then looks ahead to the 2020 budget, explaining that the Pentagon had, and I guess the Trump administration requested 78 more F-35s, as well as some uh, C-130 transport planes. However, Congress uh, didn't think that was good enough and decided to spend an extra $2 billion on 20 F-35 fighters, uh, bringing the total to 98 rather than, the again, the 78 requested. So Congress even going further to give Lockheed Martin more. And, you know, one of the reasons you would, it, it would maybe be hard to understand why the Congress would allocate more than the Pentagon was asking for. I mean, the Pentagon is going to ask for what they need, uh, in theory, at least to defend the country. So, uh, you know, if Congress is giving them more than what they need, then you think they also would have to be talking to some generals and, you know, Mark Esper and saying that what's wrong with you, you're, you're harming and putting the country at detriment. Look, we have to say, you know, you need more weapons than you're 
asking for them. But the reason this happens, I think, is because so many members of Congress get money from companies like Lockheed Martin. And, you know, why this article is about Lockheed Martin and, you know, if the percentages and the numbers would change if you're talking about Raytheon, Honeywell, or Boeing, you could pretty much, you know, plug them in here with the same analysis and the same fact that, you know, their, their weapons products sell better than even the Pentagon asked for as well. Looking at the F-35 a little bit in detail, realizes just, you know, how big of a ripoff this is for the American people. As I talked about before with the weapon systems not being that great, looking at the, the F-35, I mean, this thing's a, a piece of junk. There's not many of these things that are actually functional. They typically have to cannibalize other planes uh, to get, you know, just one or two in a fleet to work. Uh, there's a training fleet in Florida with like 13% of the, the planes are capable of flying. There's all kinds of ongoing complications with different aspects of the plane that make it dangerous to fly and not particularly effective. Also looking at the fact that the U.S. involved Turkey in the production line of the F-35, so they made certain parts for the plane, but because they bought Russian S-400 air defense systems, they now have to be removed from that supply chain. And this is, you know, costing additional hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars. So, you know, th this thing is a complete mess. It doesn't provide Americans with anything. And yet now we're going to spend well over a trillion dollars on this program. So, you know, when you then look at something like apparently Lockheed has backlogged $144 billion in sales. So I'm sure these are things that, you know, the U.S. agrees to buy F-35s this year, but then uh, they gave Lockheed Martin a uh, hundred billion dollar contract to develop some new attack helicopter but you know that hundred billion dollars they may only get 10 billion dollars in 2020 and then you know when the helicopters actually start coming they'll get more and they, you know it'll likely be adjusted and uh lucky will end up getting more and uh for a worse product than, than they had been asked for you know I'm, I'm reading snowden's autobiography and there's uh, an interesting part in here that I haven't heard discussed about this, but this kind of uh, just made me, you know, think about talking about weapons industries. How at one point Snowden is working for Dell uh, for this guy who's basically overpromising things to the CIA because he wants to get the big contract, and then you know has his team put together something that's you know good enough and passable that he doesn't get sued. And so that's another way that you come up with the F thirty five, and uh, you know just. Want to throw that out there in uh, permanent records, uh, a pretty good read. I I'm quite enjoying it. I, I only read a, a little bit of it a week, but I I'm working my way through it and uh, definitely would recommend it. Now, I'm not sure if all $144 billion in sales like he has lined up here will actually come through. You know, it may be just a fraction of that that does. Uh, but we already know they expect uh, nearly half, $60 billion of it uh, to come through within the next year. One thing that, you know, people who read this should just, I feel like, be outraged, not necessarily on the moral level, because, you know, we talk, and I'll talk in the future about the record number of airstrikes being in Afghanistan, everybody pretty much being okay with ignoring this so i i don't expect there to be this great moral outrage from the american public about you know so just so much blood money here but the fact that the, this company is ripping us off if you know if we really are in danger then it, it seems awfully problematic that we're giving this co company billions of dollars and they're giving us crappy weapons in return it's also important to remember that all this money that goes to Lockheed Martin, uh, you know, a good chunk of it will go to the executives and, and the shareholders. You know, some middle class people will make a nice living off of it. There, there's certainly other ways to better have good, high paying middle class jobs that don't involve spending a trillion dollars a year on the military. But, you know, they do estimate there's at least a few thousand jobs created because uh, of these arms contracts. Again, it's not worth it. And then a, a chunk of this money gets funneled to the congressmen uh, through donations for their uh, campaign so they could continue to run and win elections. And nobody new ever gets in. And this is kind of just a, a self-perpetuating machine. You also have some money, uh, you know, being bought in ads on different TV stations or publications. Money going to think tanks that will then produce reports that will say, hey, we need more F-35s. And then the, you know, news channel will run an ad uh, by Lockheed Martin. And then in the next segment, they'll have on that guy who's out of Think Tank that's funded by Lockheed Martin saying, 
you know, well, I have this report here and it's essential to American security that we buy more Lockheed Martin plane. And the, you know, congressman again who gets donations from Lockheed Martin will agree. And, and you know, you just have that kind of cycle that goes on here. There's a good article today in uh, the Quincy Institute, uh, Responsible Statecraft. And in that article, Kelly Balejos explains that at the very least, $174 million in foreign money went to think tanks between 2014 and 2018. You know, it's interesting here how there, there's now a whole lot of disclosure that has to happen. And in a way, as a libertarian, I, I think that's a good thing. I don't like the IRS forcing uh, groups to donate their money. But uh, it is interesting that there's never any demand from the media or the the public at large to say like, hey, you know, if you're a think tank producing reports saying that we need to go to war in all these countries, um, do, do you get any money from weapons makers or anything like that? So at least it's 174 billion articles. The article does a good job of kind of explaining why uh, we don't have a better idea of how much uh, of that money came in, uh, where that, that money is going and what countries it's coming from, and then how different countries are able to get around some of the reporting requirements here. I'll link to that article in the show notes page. All right, some other news in the U.S. The House will vote on two bills uh, today. That's Thursday the 30th. Uh, so the day before the show comes out, and I'm sure I'll talk about this next week, on uh, attempting to restrict the president from starting a war with Iran. One bill says the president must get authorization from Congress before starting a war with Iran, which, I mean, that's what the Constitution says. But anyways, uh, because, you know, we are in 2020 now, and the war on terror has been going on for nearly 20 years, and the 2001 AUMF has been used to fight uh, military options uh, from Pakistan to Niger. There is a need for, you know, Congress to, I guess, reassert this constitutional right. Trump says he'll veto this bill, so um, that that's kind of, I guess, where the country's at on this one, where as much as it would be nice to have a solution in Congress to rein in the presidency's war powers, um, it, it seems fairly un- unrestrained at this point. And it's only the occasional situation where you have an opposition party with the majority uh, in one of the houses of Congress where they will really all get together and stand up against something a president's doing. The other bill repeals the 2002 AUMF. Now, this one is even more absurd to vote than the 2001 AUMF just because, you know, this was the one to take out Saddam and his government and the U.S. took out Saddam and disbanded his army. So there, there's no real way to say that, that this 2002 AUMF applies to anything at this point. However, the Trump claims it does. I think Obama claimed uh, it did as well in order to go fight the war uh, against ISIS. So because the president of both parties set that precedent, I guess, uh, you know, that's that's, again, just the legal situation as much of a joke as it seems like. And as crazy as it sounds, as we all passed was a 10th grade civets and, you know, read the constitutional war powers. And it says the Congress has to declare war. And this was intended because, you know, we, we didn't want to have an unrestrained global empire, but rather a constitutional republic that just defends itself. So that it, it's nice to think that there's a way to get back to that through the Congress, um, but it, it doesn't seem likely at this point. So even if these bills do pass, I, I doubt they really go anywhere. The Congress is in opening an investigation into the December 2018 training incident in the Pacific where... I believe it was a F-18 Hornet collided with a refueling tanker, uh, killing six people. I talked about this in the past on the show, so I won't go into too much detail, but ProPublica did a really good report and kind of went and did an investigation and saw what happened versus the military report. And it turned out that, you know, the group that was involved in the midair refueling, as much as there was maybe a little bit of debauchery going on on the sidelines... Uh, it had nothing to do at all with the, the actual plane crash. And it seems much more likely that it was the issue that, they, you know, these people didn't have enough spare parts. So they didn't have enough planes to fly. So they didn't have enough training hours. And so then uh, a, a mistake was made because uh, the expectations put on these airmen uh, was absurd. And as much as they asked for more and more help, it was ignored. And then rather than... I guess the army being the the great institution of valor that it's uh, supposed to be 
It takes the cowardly way out, blames the airmen in a report, and, and tries to pretend like there's no systemic problems at the Pentagon. We all know that there's a lot of them. A Pentagon IG report finds that the U.S. military transport ships are not ready to provide support should the U.S. go to war. <laughs> it, it seems like these ships will only be used in a ridiculous scenario. But it's just another example of the, the Pentagon being a hopeless bureaucracy where they claim transport ships that are apparently very critical to like their war games and playing scenarios don't function the way they should. But they, they all the, the Pentagon initially said it was good just because, you know, they want to hit marks and quota. And it just really exposes that this isn't about actually defending. One of the reasons the you know U.S. military readiness is so bad is is that it's constantly overextending its military. So not only are we fighting wars across the Middle East, not only do we have to have an Eastern Front against Russia and war games against North Korea, we also have to be involved in the South China Sea, uh, where China is claiming territorial waters that it seems like it's than the normal bounds of international law but at the same time the u.s shouldn't be involved in that and we're you know we're getting involved by sailing ships around and at one point you know u.s ships were climbing into each other again because they lacked enough support you know, from the pentagon uh, to be able to operate the way they were being required to operate uh, and, and this resulted in some u.s uh, soldier stats as well i'm guessing i move on to Af- uh, afghanistan now where uh, the, the main focus here I want to take is that the U.S. dropped a record number of bombs on Afghanistan in 2019. So I guess, you know, this number comes with a little bit of an asterisk as the U.S. really only officially started announcing the data in 2010. Some people, I think, have gone back and figured up the data from like 2000 and sits on. And so I think from then on, the, this is definitely the record number, 7,423 bombs. It did only beat the 2018 record by a few airstrikes, which was uh, 7,362. You know, one of the amazing things here is that throughout the majority of 2019, from the beginning of the year on through to mid-September and then picking up again in December, you know, late November, December, the U.S. is in peace talks with the Taliban, and yet we're dropping all these bombs on them. One of the crazy things that happens here is the U.S. drops a record number of bombs on the Taliban in Afghanistan, and then when... A couple of U.S. soldiers are killed by the Taliban. Trump cancels peace talks, but, you know, he's been increasingly aggressive throughout the peace talks. And it's just that odd double standard that always seems to come in and destroy any chance of a peace deal or something good happening. This has now been going on in Afghanistan for 18 years. So, you know, kids have grown up through it. It's, I guess, a thing that the U.S. has gotten dropped thousands of bombs on your country every single year. It must, you know, have produced just a horrific situation in that country. And, it, you know, it's not the first time either in recent memory. I mean, the Taliban waged a brutal war before the Americans came in. But before that, there was the kind of proxy war going on in uh, the Afghanistan between the Soviet Union and the U.S. Uh, army and supporting the Mujahideen against uh, the Soviet backed government there. And that war, I believe, killed like a million people. Uh, most of the deaths there are on the responsibility of the Soviets. I believe. One thing about Afghanistan is it seems like no matter what the Americans do, they, they can't make very much progress. We've tried having hundreds of, of thousands, uh, 150,000, I believe, U.S. and NATO allied forces in Afghanistan with the surge, dropping thousands of bombs on that country. Uh, we're able to take some territory, but not control the whole country. We withdraw down to 8,000 troops and drop 7,000 plus bombs on the country and you know we're just continuing uh the u.s and the afghan government to lose territory to the taliban so the, you know this thing's unwinnable for the u.s the taliban say they fight will fight to the u.s leaves and so whatever happens when the u.s leaves afghanistan will eventually happen it could be in a year or two years and when it happens it could be a messy situation uh with the taliban you know moving in and taking the capital city from the afghan government maybe they find some kind of political solution the problem is the longer the usa is the more people that are gonna die uh, the taliban say they killed 29 afghan government forces and uh, the afghan government said they killed a couple score of taliban fighters and it's just more and more afghans dying as i talked about in the last show increasing number of people in afghanistan are impoverished and need humanitarian aid and at some point, the U.S. could really help the situation by 
uh, starting to withdraw our forces and let whatever is going to happen happen and uh, allow some kind of a balance of power that's sustainable uh, return to Afghanistan and some kind of non-war normalcy to return to the country. All right, on to Trump's deal of the century. Uh, there's a decent Reuters breakdown here of just some of the differences between what Donald Trump is saying and what uh, Prime Minister of Israel Netanyahu is saying about the deal of the century uh, that I'm going to link to in the show notes page because I think it uh, covers a, a couple of just key aspects and illustrates that this plan is definitely meant to fail so one thing that a lot of people noted on twitter that i think is fairly important is that if you look when trump is announcing this plan uh there's there's only israeli representatives around and if you look at who this plan was developed by uh you know jared kushner and some u.s officials along with the israelis that this isn't a, a plan that was developed with the palestinians and so to really call it like a peace deal or the deal of the century is fairly misleading. So by the U.S. and kind of the thing that we're proposing and the way the U.S. words it is to make it sound more peaceful. But I think the way that Netanyahu and the, the Israeli government wars it is much more realistic. So Trump calls what is created in the deal of the century a Palestinian state. And Netanyahu uh, refers to it as like a state with limited sovereignty. So let's go over what this Palestinian state is. There's the West Bank, but if you look at and I'll link to a map in the show notes page of the proposed thing, it looks more like a sponge than a country. Uh, lots of holes in it. Uh, there's like different carve outs for the, the different areas where the, their settlements in the middle of the, the kind of Palestinian areas of the West Bank. And, and so it, it's essentially a collection of, you know, 20 or 30 little areas that are going to be connected by roads or tunnels to the other areas. But the roads or tunnels will be through Israeli territory. There will also be some kind of tunnel or road that connects the West Bank with Gaza, although this is, again, going to be very long and, uh, you know, through Israeli territory. It doesn't look like uh, the Palestinian state will have any ports and will have very limited border crossings, maybe just the, the border with Israel, uh, excuse me, with Egypt and I guess any border crossings with Israel as at, at least on the map, there's actually no territory of Palestine that meets up with Jordan, but there are roads that are going to be, I guess, Palestinian roads that connect uh, the different West Bank little camps and Jordan. Some people are calling this a, a Bantu stand, which I guess was what the, the situation was in Africa during apartheid, where again, there was all these loose uh, connection of communities and you know, they claim this gave them some kind of self-rule, but it really doesn't. Another thing uh, that, you know, makes it obvious that this isn't a actual Palestinian state, but uh, just a territory of very limited poverty or, you know, one way you could call it just a, a bunch of little uh, refugee camps is that uh, the Palestinians won't have like their own armed forces or anything like that. Hamas is going to be forced to be disbanded. Uh, maybe it'll have its own police force, but I guess Israel will really have all of these uh, little areas surrounded. My guess is that if this isn't even the initial plan will quickly happen is that if you're trying to cross from one area of the West Bank to the other, you're going to face the same kind of checkpoints that the Palestinians already do now. And it's not going to feel anything like a sovereign state whatsoever. In Trump's part, he says that uh, the capital of Palestine will be East Jerusalem. Now, what the Palestinians call East Jerusalem is very different than even the East Jerusalem that Trump, I think, uh, was kind of indicating to. But uh, according to Netanyahu, the capital is going to be in Eastern Jerusalem, or it seems more appropriate to say East of Jerusalem in this uh, town called Al Quds. This again seems like an absolute non-starter for the Palestinians who see Jerusalem as their capital uh, with key parts uh, of Jerusalem uh, uh, being there. So this plan will annex large portions of the West Bank into Israel, most of the Jordan Valley. And again, you know, look at one of these maps. Uh, I, I really do think maybe a sponge or Swiss cheese, uh, a thin slice of it would be a good example of what these uh, states look like. You know, there's some loose connections, but overall, it, it seems like it's going to very quickly just turn into a bunch of, of 
Palestinian refugee-ish camps. I mean, I guess some of the people who live there will be from there, but they'll be completely surrounded and at the whims and mercy of the Israeli state, uh, which has shown them just so much hostility over the... Now, Trump says that Israel is pledging a four-year land freeze with, I guess, a four-year freeze on the building of settlements. This is the only thing that you could call an Israeli concession, as far as I could tell in this deal. Um, there, there may be some small things, but, the, you know, this is the biggest, and it, it doesn't appear to be that big of one because Netanyahu is saying that this is only, you know, in the, in the I guess, the, the contested areas, but in other areas are going to continue with the settlement expansion. Now, part of this deal seems to be that if the Palestinians don't accept it in four years, then Israel could just, you know, go about, I guess, annexing the rest of the West Bank or, uh, you know, continue with the settlement expansion. So th this isn't a deal that would ever be accepted by the Palestinians. It has numerous, you know, poison pills in there for them. But, you know, that's the absolute point. On the last show, I had just mentioned that I thought we would quickly see some people saying that, see, you know, you propose a peace deal to the Palestinians and they throw it back in your face and... Sure enough, before I even was able to publish the show, but I assure you that right after I had recorded it, I see Ben Shapiro out there on Twitter saying that, you know, look at these rioting Palestinians can't even accept a good peace deal once in front of them. So, you know, he's a despicable guy, but he does represent the viewpoint of a lot of people. And so that is something that you're going to hear and, and make sure that you could go out there and say that, no, this was never something that the Palestinians would accept. They weren't involved in negotiations, and the, the whole point of this deal was just to allow Israel uh, to take more and more of the West Bank, the parts that they want, and leave uh, the Palestinians with with something that's not really a state, but they somewhat call, you know, oh, there's a little bit of sovereignty there, and they're going to use that to say they're trying to make a deal with the Palestinians, and when the Palestinians continue to resist, I'm guessing they're just going to continue with the same policy of either moving them off the land or, uh, you know, using more force, arrest, stuff like that. So I think what I'm going to title this show is The Steal of the Century, because that's why I think the, the deal really is here. Um, that we're just, you know, going to put this out there as something the Palestinians would never agree to and is going to be used by the Israeli uh, to vote the theft of more Palestinians and the continued occupation of the Palestinian people. All right, everyone, that's the show. Hope you liked it. ForeignPolicyFocus.libsyn.com, LibertarianInstitute.org, at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E on Twitter. There's a private Facebook group, Foreign Policy Focus, Patreon.com slash Foreign Policy Focus, and... I am the assistant editor over at antiwar.com, so uh, check out that site.